Hello, Hubble Huggers, and welcome to another Hubble Hangout. In this one, uh, I'm really excited about this one because this is one of the first ones I've been doing. I'm actually doing this as the Hubble Space Telescope. It's funny because I don't, I don't feel like one. I don't feel any different. But you know, it's, it, it says that I am the Hubble Space Telescope now, and so I'm here uh, broadcasting as the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, you also see me here, but I uh, as a uh, member of the chat. But I've just got the uh, Hubble Hangout banner on there. So let me just show you that because that's really awesome. That was done by uh, Christine Godfrey here at the institute, and I think it's an awesome graphic. So I just wanted to put that up there real quick. So before I get started with introductions, let me tell you how you can interact with the Hubble Space Telescope. That is me. What you do is you can comment on the Google Plus event page if you want to, and that's. You may be watching this event here. In fact, let me, I should probably type uh, refresh your browser on the hey. event page. Um, also, um, you can leave comments on the YouTube channel if you happen to be on Hubble site channel where we are also broadcasting. Uh, you can leave your comments there. You can also tweet. Oh, we didn't do a hashtag. Um, Hubble Hangouts. That's awful long. You're going to use up a lot of your characters, but if you use the hashtag Hubble Hangout, we'll see that as well. So leave questions and comments. We'll have plenty of time for that, hopefully toward the end, where we'll try to get to all that, unless I see a particularly interesting one in the middle, and we'll just blurt it out somewhere along the line. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be able to do that. So new format slightly. With me also, as he always is, is Dr. Alberto Conti. Hello, Alberto. Hey, Tony. How are you? Nice to be here. Yeah, thank you. He's the uh, James Webb Space Telescope Innovation Scientist. So, Alberto, what's new with the, uh, with the web? Are we still on track for 2018? We are on track for 2018. We're making quite a bit of progress in uh, testing. We have uh, two of the instruments at Goddard Space Flight Center that are being uh, tested right now and waiting to be integrated. There's a lot of uh, uh, time. Time. A lot of time is going to be spent into doing testing for the next uh, few years. So it's a very exciting time, and so far we're doing very well. So nothing major to report, either negative or positive. We're just doing very, very well. We're on track. We're very excited, and uh, we're working hard to make uh, sure we stick to that mm -hmm. deadline. Awesome. I mean, they're building all that right down the road, aren't they, down at Goddard? Yeah, it's just around the road. It's a few miles from here, a few kilometers if you're um, ah, in the yes. old country. Oh, there so you go. <laughs> More quick for the win. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, good. I mean, 2018 can't come soon enough for me, so I can't wait. I'm glad to hear it. Okay, thanks for the update. And also, brand new addition, Scott Lewis from hey, knowthecosmos.com. He is, uh, you recognize him probably as the co-host for the Virtual Star Party with Fraser Kane. He also inexplicably goes with the uh, Twitter handle, the bald astronomer. I'm not quite sure what that's about. It must, it must be... It's, it's a long story. It's a very <laughs> long story. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, welcome, Scott. It's a real pleasure to have you with these Hangouts. I'm looking forward to, to working with you on these. And uh, you've been, you're an awesome person in these things. So thanks for coming. Hey, you know, I've tried to emulate you as much as possible. I, I, that, I find that almost always serves me it's, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if, if you weren't so humble, you wouldn't be perfect. So, all right, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm getting fed just by living. <laughs> okay. So now, as you all know from the title of the Hangout, we are going to, we are here to talk about comets, and in particular, Comet Ison. And I would like to introduce uh, uh, some planetary scientists we have with us today, uh, two of which work at the uh, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute and the other one at the Planetary Science Institute. So why don't we start with Bonnie uh, Meinke. Um, Hi, Bonnie. Hi. Hi. So why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us what you're, tell us what you're doing. Sure. Uh, I'm a planetary scientist, but I'm also a content specialist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in the Office of Public Outreach. And uh, what I've mostly studied my whole career is Saturn, but I had one project back when I was an undergrad in college where I studied the possibility of interstellar comets. So, awesome. That's my background in cometry. In cometry, oh, that's a great one. Cometry. Wow. You, you, you hashtag. Invented. Hashtag. Yeah, <laughs> cometry. I like that. But we don't mean trees on comets, right? <laughs> okay, and also with me, Max Muchler from the also from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Max. Oh, oh you're muted. He's muted. Sorry, unmuted. Uh, <laughs> 
So, uh, my name is Max Mutchler. I'm a research and instrument scientist here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I've actually been here working on the entire Hubble mission, 23 years, and uh, I'm an expert on Hubble's cameras, so I really know how to design observations and uh, reduce the data that comes out of it. And uh, I also am a member of the Hubble Heritage team that is doing some of the observations of Comet Ison, uh, the one that was released yesterday and, and one that was released earlier, and we have uh, more observations coming up. So uh, I've been involved with a lot of planetary science with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, earlier comet observations, including ones that have broken up, and uh, uh, observations of asteroids and dwarf planets like Ceres and Pluto. And um, so excited to be a part of this, uh, these comet ice sun observations and, uh, you know, look forward to a lot, lot more coming forward. Awesome. Yeah, well, welcome. That's good to have you here, Max. And also with us is Zhang Yang, Dr. Zhang Yang Li from the Planetary Science Institute. Welcome. Can you tell, introduce, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hello. Hi, Tony. Glad to be here. Yeah. And uh, my name is Zhang Yang Li, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a research scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. And I mostly work on um, almost all the solar system uh, small bodies um, at, where we have data, of course. And I actually started as a commentary scientist uh, at University of Maryland and, uh, with uh, Dr. Mo uh, Mike O'Hearn. And if you don't know, the, don't know the name, that's fine, but you, I think you must know the, the mission, uh, Deep Impact Mission. And Mike yeah. O'Hearn was... Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that's how I started my work on comets. Awesome. And then right now, I'm, I'm also working on the on asteroid missions. Like, uh, I'm also, I also participated in Dawn mission as a science team member. And I also worked on the uh, Dixie mission, which is the extended mission of Deep Impact, and also Stardust Next, which was the uh, uh, the extended mission of Stardust mission. And uh, so, um, and that's that's you know that's what I do right now. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk awesome. more about coming out. Well, welcome. It's awesome to meet you. I'm glad. Looking forward to finding out all more about comets from you. And also with us. That is Zolt LeVay. He's been on these Hangouts many times before with other things, but he is a uh, imaging, he's the one that takes the images that uh, Max has uh, provided and turns them into amazing looking images. Well, welcome, Zolt. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody, and uh, glad to see everybody here. Yeah, I'm in the Office of Public Outreach here, uh, imaging group lead in the Office of Public Outreach, and I'm also the uh, lead of the Hubble Heritage team. Max uh, was talking about Hubble Heritage. And some of the observations that we'll be talking about were conducted uh, uh, for Hubble Heritage. Okay, so what, before we get into the discussion too much, I want to start right off the bat by introducing one of the reasons we're here is we want to introduce the ISON blog that we've started at the Institute on HubbleSite.org. I have it up on the page now. Uh, on the very first, on the very top of the blog is uh, an image that Zolt, Zolt helped create, which we'll talk about more in this. But there are all kinds of uh, posts on here all about not just Comet Ison, but comets in general. So we're hoping that you will subscribe to the RSS feed on this and see the posts. Uh, some things that are imminent is I've got a video coming up on whether or not Comet Ison will actually hit us. That's going to go on the Hubble Site channel, YouTube channel, and we'll post it on this blog. So look for that in the next, uh, in the next hopefully, the next day or so. But the uh, URL for this is, um, unfortunately, I can't get my lower thirds to work because I'm doing this as the, as the Google Plus page and I had all kind of permission problems. So uh, the uh, web, the, hopefully you can see the uh, uh, URL up there, but I will also be posting it on the event page. It's hubblesite.org slash go slash ISON, and that will get you there uh, to check it out. So please subscribe to it and uh, follow it or and, and, and leave comments and do what you can and interact with us on this. Okay, guys, so comets and Comet Ison. Hubble is going to observe this. Now, is this a new thing? Is, com is this one of the first comets that Hubble has ever observed or has it done this before? Who wants to go? Max? Go, Max. Max. Go Max, it again. Go. Yeah, I'll take that one. No, Hubble's done a lot of uh, comet, comet observations. I've been involved in quite a few of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I would say, uh, going back to the very beginning, probably the most famous one early on was shortly after uh, Hubble was repaired in 1993, late 1993. Um, couldn't have been scripted any better. We had a comet, Shoemaker-Levy 9, that broke up 
due to a close interaction with Jupiter, broke up into a string of comets, which then slammed into Jupiter uh, just about six months after Hubble was repaired. So it was just a beautiful, uh, you know, obviously a fantastic, never before seen astronomical event of a comet breaking up and slamming into Jupiter. But then you have a, a recently repaired Hubble just primed to actually observe it the way we can um, with the full resolution sensitivity that Hubble offers. So that's certainly the earliest, most memorable one. But since then, I, there's just been countless comet observations. I've been involved with, uh, there was one a few years ago called schwassmann vachmann 3, which broke up similarly into a string of pearls and was just one of the most stunning, uh, you know, breakups of a comet ever seen. And uh, also Comet Holmes, which was just a ridiculously bright eruption uh, of a comet, and a whole bunch that I'm sure I can't think of. Uh, I think John Yang Lee can probably remember a few more, and, and uh, certainly uh, we expect to have many more going forward. So, so, so Hubble's been pretty active then in looking at comets. Now, the, the other one, the SW3 one, I don't, I don't pronounce it the long way because I don't want to even try. But the uh, that one's actually going to be in the longer version of the video that I'm making where I talk about that string of pearls you were talking about. Alberto, you just had that image of. Uh, of actually, that was uh, that was Shumaker oh, Levy nine, yeah. uh, and it was observation of uh, you know you, you remember that probably Shumaker Levy nine was very very interesting. At least I remember very very clearly because it's actually smashed into something, which is uh, Jupiter, which is uh, which <laughs> is fortunate for something. us. <laughs> well, it's very fortunate for us because it's like a giant vacuum cleaner that helps us uh, not being wiped out of the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this was observations of the scars, if you will, that um, uh, a Hubble observer the. Uh, the southern part of Jupiter has uh, come uh, Shumaker Levy hit. I thought it was uh, an astonishing. But uh, Max is Max is right. I mean, Hubble has been at this for uh, many many years, and uh, and there are quite a few. I, I don't, I you know, I don't know them all. Maybe maybe others can intervene. And and, uh, so, and actually, I, you brought up a really good a really good point that I'd like Bonnie to comment on for just a second. Jupiter acts as a kind of solar system vacuum cleaner or some, um, some sort. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Because that's an interesting point, I think. Um, Jupiter actually protects us quite a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it's this gatekeeper to the inner solar system because it's so massive. So how does it do it? I mean, what is it? Is it just because it, it, it has a gravitational field that keeps things diverted or it just happens to draw things into itself so that it gets smashed into it instead of other planets? Yeah, basically. Um, it grabs things gravitationally, um, diverts them off their original course, uh, and sometimes those things, you know, change their overall orbits, come back around and hit uh, Jupiter itself, or sometimes they're captured into these little uh, communities of asteroids that flank Jupiter in its orbit. Um, and sometimes they're tossed way the heck out of the solar system altogether. Wow. So it, it does a good job of protecting what's inside of the orbit. So that's all of the terrestrial planets. I wonder how much, I wonder how big of a, uh, how much, how likely it would have been we would have survived had uh, had Jupiter not been there. I did, I'd never really thought of it like that before. So I think it's pretty cool. So so, may, so maybe calling it a vacuum cleaner is not actually very very nice. We should call it something of the savior or some sort. The of that. <laughs> Jupiter the savior? I don't think I want to go there. No, <laughs> but you know, but it just uh, it has a, a, a stabilizing effects on you know on uh, sort of who gets hammered by comets or something, which is it's actually our Jovian big brother protecting us out in the there you go the playground exactly. out there. there you go. Yeah, there keeping you go. all the bullies away from. That's right. Yes. <laughs> there you go. That's much better than Savior, yes. You'll be a big brother. Okay, that's so there you go, folks. A new role for Jupiter. Uh, the, our big brother. Our really, really big brother. Okay, so um, with, uh, with one of the interesting things about comets in general, and we'll get to Comet Ison in just a minute, that I, that I think is, is, is an important topic is we, a lot of when when we started tracking Comet Ison and we decided we were going to make this blog and we were going to do some uh, some some articles and some topics on the blog. The first thing we do is we look, you know, we did some Google searches to find out what other people were asking. And of course, one of the big ones is is Comet Ison going to hit us? Now, I don't want to talk about that directly, but I want to talk about the more at least not right now because we'll go get into it a little bit later. But right now, I would like to address this issue of comets actually hitting a planet, especially one like Earth, is actually not a bad thing. Is I mean because it can bring some uh, important things for life on Earth, I uh, hear. Uh, at least that's the theory, right? Anybody care to comment on that? Yeah, I can, I can just add one comment, which is the way I always put it is that comets, and you could say asteroids as well, they giveth and they taketh away, right? It's a part of the story of how the Earth got its oceans. Uh, there's no reason to think the Earth had water early on. 
And I think a big scientific question, still an open question, is how Earth got its oceans. Comets clearly seem to probably play a role in that, but they, they don't seem to answer the entire question. And uh, but so, you know, it might be that, you know, again, what what giveth life on Earth, right? We, we needed water on Earth to have life and to have us. And then, of course, you're familiar with the, uh, you know, the event that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, you know, an asteroid or comet impact that that can wipe out life. So mm -hmm. depending on the timing, it can either give it or take it away. And but either way, they clearly have a big role to play in the story of life on Earth. Well, I think a great question about that, too, is what's the difference between a comet and, say, something like this that smashes into the Earth? So a, a meteorite coming down, they're, they're different. And maybe people don't understand the difference between a meteor and a comet. Can we go into what, what the difference between them is and why they would do different things with an impact? Sure. I mean, a meteor is a, is a very small particle. I mean, most of the you know, meteor streaks you see in the sky are probably like a dust fleck or maybe a piece of gravel. Uh, obviously, the Russian meteorite was larger than that, um, but that was a pretty rare event. And quite often what they are is, is the, the, the particles uh, left over from a comet, you know, kind of in the trail of a comet that we plow through. The reason they occur, you know, the ones that occur on a regular date in the year, it's because uh, a track, think of it as like a horse that's been running around the same track and leaving a trail. And, uh, you know, the, once a year we plow through that trail and that we get a meteor shower. But, again, those are very small particles, so not like, you know, like an entire comet or an entire asteroid. Yeah, in fact, uh, if I may, oh, I'm sorry. If if I may add something to to what Max has said, uh, yep, you know, some, for a lot of uh, a lot of uh, actually all the meteorites, they have to survive the atmosphere, survive uh, passing the atmosphere. So they have to have some strength. They have to strong be strong enough. And those those meteorites are mostly uh, come from actually mostly come from uh, from from asteroids rather than comets. And those particles that are jet off from comets, they mostly just stay very weak. I mean, by weak, I mean you know, if they, if you take some, take a part of it and put it on the ground, it will collapse right away. So, so for that kind of strength, it's very hard for them to pass the Earth Earth's atmosphere. Most of them just burnt out, you know, in, when they pass the atmosphere, taking the, uh, the 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 fireball out of the sea. And also, also, um, also, um, right now we consider that a lot of uh, meteor meteor showers are actually causing by uh, by the by the bigger particles, like centimeter size or millimeter size, millimeter size particles, are left over, uh, left out in the in the trail of comet, in, in orbit of comet. And when Earth when Earth passes the orbit, the comet's orbit, that will a lot of uh, a lot of such possible into the atmosphere atmosphere and make a uh, meteor shower. So, so, so those so, comets, are they the ones that were the uh, the short period, the ones that, that make return visits? We're going to get to the different, different kind of comets in a minute. But these are the comet, the, the uh, uh, meteor showers that we see, you say were particles left over from some of the, the comets that have gone by. Do these tend to be the periodic comets that leave debris in certain spots in space, or are they uh, all comets? Well, well, potentially, potentially, all the comets have the uh, ha, have the ability to make uh, meteor showers. As long as you know, all the all the comets are losing particles in their in their orbits, mm -hmm. and as long as Earth uh, passes their orbit, you know, Earth's orbit and uh, the the comet's orbit cross, um, you know, when Earth passes the orbit, the, there will be a chance to have a meteor shower. Um, so you know, you know, comet ice actually. I mean, Earth will pass comet ice's orbit in January, and that will that will be another story. You know, we might have some kind of meteor shower from ice on too. Okay, so there's different kinds of comets. I alluded to this just just, uh, just a while ago. Uh, we we have these we have these comets that make return visits. They come around. They and they're called uh, shorter period comets. Then we also have long period comets. Bonnie, can you can you comment a little bit on the difference between those kinds of comets? Uh, short period comets tend to come from the Kuiper Belt, which is that region of icy bodies just outside of Neptune's orbit, and uh, so those come back on a regular basis. They're they come in, you know, like periods of say under 200 years. Um, so human history actually has a record of these things reoccurring. A good example is Halley's Comet yeah. that last appeared in uh, 1986. So everyone, my little sister was born in 1986. Everyone in her class was named Haley. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I imagine awesome. that that might happen <laughs> on comet years for, for these popular short period comets. Um, long period comets come from much farther out and are usually on a, uh, a one-time trip through the inner solar system. So those things come from the Oort cloud, which is this huge outer sphere of icy debris 
that stretches as far as uh, 50,000 times as far away from the sun as the Earth is. So is that the right way to pronounce it? I always say Oort. Am I saying it wrong? <laughs> I've always said Oort just because it's easier. But oh, okay. I, yeah, I turn, it, I turn that into two syllables. Is that okay? Is that proper or is that wrong? No, it's completely wrong. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I'm just joking. I did Oort, yeah. The Oort cloud. Oort. Or, or, okay. Or, or, okay. Or, yeah. So those so those are longer period. They they tend to have these uh, uh, orbits that are uh, parabolic or hyperbolic, and they only they only come through once generally, right? They wreak all kinds of mischief and then they leave. And that brings us to comet Ison, right? That's what kind is it? Uh, Ison is a long period comet. Ah, so it came from the Oort cloud or or. Yes. Cloud. So, so okay. but one thing, maybe it's important to actually notice that, you know, the, I think the Oort cloud is also a reservoir, as, uh, as Bonnie mentioned, but it's a gigantic reservoir. I was reading numbers where they, they might count the trillions of, uh, of these objects just, just sitting out there waiting to be disrupted gravitationally and then fall inside, you know, in, in this uh, very hyperbolic orbit, which I find actually mind-boggling. Yeah, agreed. So, uh, so let's talk. Okay, let, let me get Zolt in on this a little bit. So Zolt, you you released a um, an image of this comet. Uh, actually, you released several. Why don't you talk about some of the images you put out uh, of of this comet that came from Hubble? Sure. Um, let me. Uh, I can yeah, show we one. we've released a few. Oh, okay, here's okay, Albert that's... just got one up. That's the latest one. Okay, the latest one. Yeah, let me talk about that one first. Oh, it's okay. The freshest and it's. Uh, we're highlighting that, <clears throat> excuse me, on the blog right away. So let me uh, share my screen. I've just got a few. Well, I have it up already, Zolt. Oh, you do. Yeah, right. I have it up. It's already it's already embiggened. Okay. So um, this image, uh, let me see here. So this image is actually a little different from ones we've done before, for a couple of reasons. Um, as you can see, it's in color. So we took images through different colored filters, two different colored filters, and composited them into a color composite image. So that's why you see some of the stars are bluish and some of the stars are reddish. And in fact, you see other stuff in the background. You see galaxies and you see some stars. So uh, it's a little bit different image from Hubble, at least, of a comet. You see the comet fairly small in a larger field of view uh, with this background of stars and galaxies. Yeah, that, that truly is a view that only Hubble can provide. I mean, that's amazing. Well, at least of this comet right now. So, <laughs> uh, and the other unusual thing about this image was that uh, we tracked not on the comet this time, but on the stars. And comets, as as rapidly moving solar system objects, they they move pretty fast across the sky in relative terms. And so, even in a fairly short exposure of a few minutes, the comet actually trails uh, across the field of view. So uh, if you look closely, and in fact, if I do um, share my screen okay. and uh, show another, another uh, slide here. OK, we're looking at it now. OK, so I will, so th here's the image again. Right. But this, uh, this slide shows all the images we took. So we actually took five separate exposures. So there are three exposures in one filter at the top. That was a uh, visible light uh, filter in the sort of yellow-green uh, part of the spectrum. And on the bottom, there are two images that are Wait, we're not red. looking at that. We're look all we can see is the, is the second slide. We see the oh, one really? says April 30, 2013. Yeah, are you doing a slideshow? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, that that doesn't tend to work. You now you need to. There you go. Now we're looking at okay. it. Okay. Now you can see it. Okay. Yeah. I'll just show yeah. it like this. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we took five images. The the three images in V are at the top, and two images in in red are at the bottom. And if you were to look closely at that, you might see that the that the comet was moving, but it's a little hard to see in the separate images. Um, so it, it, in this image, however. Um, Maybe I can make this a little bit bigger. There, that's real nice. Okay, so these are the, the so these are all the images through each filter composite. So there are three images in the V filter, and as you can see, the comet looks kind of funny. It's actually got this sort of L-shaped little patch. The stars are nice and 
and pinpoint because we were tracking on the stars. the stars. But while we were tracking through the three exposures, the comet moved a little bit. And like I said, this, this is not the way comets are usually observed. We want to actually have the comet be uh, as, as stationary as possible, so we usually track on the comet. But in this case, we wanted to get this background, this background of stars and galaxies fairly deep uh, and show the comet in front of it. Um, but the comet did move. However, with uh, a little bit of, I won't say trickery exactly. <laughs> NASA trickery. NASA. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew a NASA. A little bit of manipulation. Oh. We were able to, well, first of all, we, we applied color to the two images. So we yeah. applied a blue color to the, uh, the V-filter image and a red color to the, to, the I, to the I band, a red image, and uh, composited those together to make the color composite. So this is the original color composite. You can see that the comet is a little bit funky there. So Yeah, I can see um, the L shape now that I yeah, saw the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we, uh, what we did was we uh, ex actually replaced that comet image with one of the exposures where the comet was trailed the least. Well, you just took all kinds of liberties here. We just, we, <laughs> we didn't, okay, we didn't, we didn't much. Fake it, exactly. But, you know, we, we try to make a nice looking image. So, and we cleaned it up a little bit. There's some retouching done. There's some artifacts from uh, the chip gap and other, other things that we, uh, right. that we cleaned up a little bit. But, um, and that's something I think you bring up a good point. Let's talk about that just a little bit because I don't think people appreciate, well, you know, maybe some people do, but there's, there's this idea that these images just sort of come out of the telescope like this. And they really don't, do they, Max? I mean, they really don't, you know, have these real pristine sort of uh, colors to them and everything else. Like, well, the way they come out of the camera, or at least off the Hubble Tight Space Telescope, is actually kind of messy, aren't they? I mean, that's one of the things you do is you help kind of clean them up a little bit, right? That's right. I mean, I could uh, screen share as well here to show what the data looks like before it gets to Zolt's desk. Uh, so I'm going to switch here to screen share mode. Um, okay. So I might be able to show with a little bit higher resolution as well what, uh, what Zolt was talking about. So this first image I'm showing you here is just one of the uh, long uh, visual band exposures. And I think you can see right there the, uh, you can see the comet tail looking about the same, but you can see the comet nucleus, instead of being a nice dot, is, is a little bright line at about a 45 degree angle. And that's because it moved during the exposure, right? That's right. So we took a long exposure. That's why we got, you know, you need a longer exposure in order to detect all those stars and especially the galaxies in the background. How long was it, do you know? Um, yeah, this was something like 200 seconds, something like that. Okay. okay. Um, so that's how much the comet moves in that amount of time during this long exposure. And then if I go to the next one, so then you stop that exposure, you take another one, and you see the comet has moved. That's the next exposure. Then I'll click to see the next one, and you can see it's kind of turning a corner there in the L, and I'll explain that in a second. And the next one, and the next one. And uh, if I go to the, let's see, here's, here's sort of the L image that Zolt was showing. Oh, wow. Right. All, all of them together. So. The comet itself is moving in a linear fashion, and the reason it looks a little bent like that is because Hubble itself is moving as well. Uh, during one orbit, Hubble goes from one side of the Earth to the other, and so that's called parallax, um, you know, which you, you experience yourself with you know, something that's close to you, and you move your head side to side. Um, you know, the thing that's close to you uh, moves more than something that's farther away, and so you get you know, that, that sense of uh, you know, perspective. So, you know, that weird motion you see there has more to do with the motion of Hubble than with the motion of the comet itself. Um, now, just to show you how messy the image is, to get back to your original point, um, I'll pull up the same, the same version of this image. Now, this is after I've cleaned it up quite a bit. So now I'm going to switch to what, more what, what that image looks like before I've cleaned it up. And what do you ah! see here? <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> so this is, this is a raw image, right? This is what it comes, comes out of Hubble. Right, so you know we've been looking at cleaned up images, and it you know it takes some effort. And, and this this last one I'm showing you right now shows all the junk, you know, before I clean it out. So what are you seeing here? You, you got a mixture of the real stuff, the comet, the stars, the galaxies, but then you got all these big things, these bright things here, like this big bright one going right through the comet tail. And there's an even brighter one right up near the comet. Yeah. Those are called cosmic rays, and all these little flecks too. It looks like salt and pepper has been shaken all over the image. Um, you know, one of the reasons we uh, Put a telescope above the Earth's atmosphere is the Earth's atmosphere protects us from all that radiation out in space. Right. So 
it's great that you know life on Earth wouldn't be possible if the atmosphere wasn't protecting us. But of course, uh, you get up above the atmosphere to to get above the blurring atmos you know effects of the atmosphere, and now you're exposed to that radiation. So while we're taking this 200 long second, uh, 200 second exposure, all this radiation is flying right through the telescope and peppering every image with these uh, cosmic rays that you see. And then of course, there's also detector artifacts. No no camera is perfect, so there's all kinds of in a sense, junk coming from the, the camera itself that needs to be cleaned out. Bad so pixels, hot pixels, things like that, right? Exactly. And so we, yeah. that's why we take many exposures, is to uh, not only gather information in different wavelengths of light, as Zolt described, to make a color image, we have different filters, but we also, within a filter, take multiple exposures so that we can combine them. And by comparing the images to each other, uh, if I take you know three or four images in a row that should be identical, the, the stars and the comet and the galaxies will all be in the exact same place, but the cosmic rays will be in random locations so that you can compare the images and say anything that's uh, in all the images must be real, and anything that's in random locations must be cosmic rays and reject it, and that's how you get a clean image. So uh, you can see we are contending with quite a bit here, and sometimes you're lucky in the sense that um, you really don't want a bright cosmic ray going right over the top of your, your image. It might be tough to clean out. You might notice in some of these images, um, I'm just going to click through to one. Uh, for the, for the uh, red exposures, we didn't take as many. We only took two, and that makes it harder to clean up. And you'll notice right above the two comet trails here, there's a, yeah, pretty, there bright, is. There's a pretty bright cosmic ray. That you, yeah. you know, there's that really bright one. I couldn't get it completely cleaned out. So it's just sort of a cautionary tale that no astronomical images are perfect. There can be artifacts that, you know, you know, hanging around that, you know, you might look at an image like this and get excited about and think, well, that's something to do with this comet, when in fact it's just a random cosmic ray that couldn't get cleaned all the way out. Well, I was so, going to uh, say it might have been a spaceship or something uh, right behind well, we, it. There, but. You know, we, it's an important point to make because we have been inviting, normally, historically, we, it's mostly professional scientists who've been getting into our archive, you know, people who use Hubble getting into our archive, but we have been inviting the whole world in there to, you know, have a look at our, our data and of course, it just requires a, you know, a few more skills in terms of understanding what you're seeing and interpreting data. And looking at raw data, as I pointed out in the last one, there's a lot of junk there. And you know, The untrained eye might get excited about what they see, thinking that this long streak is something more exciting than just a cosmic ray. But, uh, so, um, and that's why we actually provided, uh, actually posted our cleaned up images. Um, there's a link to it from the blog uh, um, yeah. and also from the press release. So, People who are interested in playing with the actual data in FITS format, um, if you don't know what FITS format is, you probably don't want to do that. Um, but you know, a, lot of, a lot of amateur astronomers, a lot of amateur astronomers, and, and including professional astronomers, are familiar with that. And so, kind of getting at the data behind the image, um, you, you know, you can follow that link to actually get my version of the data, which uh, took a lot of careful processing. Unfortunately, yeah. our our routine pipeline doesn't do such a great job, so it really requires a lot of offline, you know tender loving care to get the image, you know, a cleaned up image like you see. Uh, okay, but don't give away too much of our punchline because that was that that whole topic is going to be another hangout uh, that's coming a little bit later, uh, either not early next month, I think, so or sometime next month. So we're going to be talking about getting Hubble Ison uh, data uh, the way the way Max is talking about right now, uh, and just in, in in a future hangout. So we want, definitely want you to stay tuned for that one. So um, okay, well I gotta I gotta move on to something different here because one of the things you can do when you're in a hangout with a bunch of other people is you can kind of see that there's this little chat window that you guys don't get to see but that we do, and this yeah. is where everybody makes fun of everybody else when you know like they call me names or I call Scott a name or whatever. You're but there's actually a really cool conversation going on on the side here uh, where Scott was reading uh, one of the comments uh, and the questions and so um, the, the, can you guys kind of talk about what you're chatting about over here Scott go ahead yeah so the the question posed was by Budini Samara Singer and she's asking what's the most dramatic example of terraforming that can be attributed to a comet either earth or another planet within the solar system thanks <laughs> well, I, th I think that terraforming in the sci-fi sense, where we yeah. go to another planet and make it like Earth, that really doesn't happen. But comets and all the other small bodies in the uh, solar system are always terraforming, so to speak. They're always changing the surfaces of planets. So uh, look at the moon, all those impact craters. Mars is full of impact craters, as is Mercury, and a lot of the icy satellites around uh the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mar, uh, 
uh, Neptune and Uranus. And so there's, there's all kinds of examples of these impact craters. And uh, Zhang Yang, you also had a comment on there. Why don't you say what you were typing in there as well? <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say a very similar thing as what Bonnie just said. Um, you know, com comets are basically too small to contribute any uh, significant mass on, on any planets. You know, mostly comets are just a few kilometers in size. And the largest comet we know so far is Comet Hell Bob, uh, which I think has a, a radius of seven, uh, 35 kilometers. And in comparison, the Earth has a has a, a radius of six thousand four hundred kilometers. So that's huge. So in that sense, um, in, in that sense, I don't think um, comet will make significant contribution to make any lands on any planets. Okay, but, but well, maybe, maybe they don't contribute a lot to the land, but to the land area or, what, or you know actual real estate. But they do add a lot of, of chemistry, right? I mean, there's a lot of chemical. Uh, contributions right. that they make. How Do you have an idea of the percentage? I mean, you know, we have a planet, it's forming, it's got an atmosphere, these comets are bombarding it. Let's say, I guess the early Earth had a pretty, uh, had a pretty uh, toxic atmosphere early on and comets started hitting it. Is it a majority of an effect or is it just a minute effect? What, 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 well, or maybe, we or maybe it's impossible to predict, I don't know. Well, we have to know that the Earth, the, I mean, the Earth's atmosphere, atmosphere is only a very, very small part of the Earth, or total mass of the Earth. So in that sense, uh, you know, comets just need to contribute a tiny bit of organic or or, or water to the to, to, to the earth to make a very thin um, we call that biosphere. So 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 you know, it's it's not a, it's not measured in, in how much mass or how much uh, percentage. It's measured by uh, its importance. If there's no you know, probably right now we think probably it's just the comets or some kind of uh, asteroids that delivered organics to the earth or, or water that makes life. That's the importance. You know, that doesn't matter how much it is. So is it adding just more diversity of the chemistry to, you know, to you know the iron nickel planetoid that's forming there? It's just adding some additional chemistry that wasn't necessarily there because it was outside the frost line when it's forming. Uh, yeah, I think most importantly maybe water because uh, you know uh, uh, early uh, early on very very early on the Earth it's very hot and uh, there are there are volcanics everywhere. I think Bonnie may may want to say something about this, but. You know that kind of high temperature will drive out all the water, at least on the surface, near the surface of, of the Earth. And then later, when the Earth when the Earth uh, cool down and you know cool down to the current temperature or slightly higher than now, where it can retain water or you know water liquid water or water vapor, at that time you know some kind of uh, um, comets, some comets or um, or as well other other um, impacts, other things impact the Earth and deliver the water. That's the current. And that's what we current think. About you know how water comes from, uh, how water originates from the earth. All of it? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> That's a pretty so, big you know that The the yep. comments make it rain, huh? Yeah. That's what's going on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Scott brought up a term and he didn't define it. He said the frost line. Yeah. Uh, who, who wants to tell us what that is? Nobody? Nobody. I, I can tell you what it is. Oh, I know we have some somebody, at least someone knows what it is. Whoo, our credibility is about to be wiped out there. I was, I was, being, I was, I was deferring. You were being polite. I'll, I'll cover it. No, no, no. That, that's rule number one. Don't be polite. Just go. Okay, I won't be polite. <laughs> Please be rude. Um, so the frost line uh, is the line, uh, the distance from the sun at which certain, I'm going to use another word, volatiles can oh, exist. Good, I'm so glad a, you said that. <laughs> a volatile is, uh, water is a volatile, there's a lot of other sorts of ices and things that are in the outer solar system that are considered volatiles. They're things that you add a little bit of energy to them and they evaporate or sublimate and go away. So they don't like to exist around heat. So when you're close enough to the sun, you're not going to be able to exist as a volatile. And that sets up the frost line. And in our solar system, the frost line is outside of, of, uh, of where, I don't know exactly where the frost line lies in our solar system. <laughs> it's somewhere around Mars-ish. Okay. It's, it's, it's actually around 3 AU, 2.5 AU to 3 okay. AU, or 2.5 uh, times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that's where actually where Comet Ison is now. It's right there at that at that frost line. Yep, yeah. Comet Ison is working on crossing the frost, uh, frost line now. And that's one of those important things. That's why we care about the frost line as it relates to comets, because we get this beautiful tail on a comet, 
and the coma and all of that stuff uh, starts to appear as the comet gets closer and closer to the sun because these things are warming up and these volatiles are coming off of the, the nucleus itself and making the real structure of what we think of as a comet. So awesome. since Ison is since Ison is now crossing the cross line, does it mean its tail is going to be a lot bright, bigger and brighter now? Well, that's what awesome. we all hope, right? Yeah, that's what we all hope. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah, we can't see it, unfortunately, right not, now. It's not saying that Comet Ison was not active before it crosses the frost line. It's just just saying that uh, within the frost line, water will be sublimated much faster than it was before it crosses the frost line. And, and actually, before that, that was yeah, possibly uh, a volatile stuff that sublimate at much lower temperature, likely, uh, most likely the carbon dioxide and or carbon monoxide. So <clears throat> that's what we think. Okay, so let's. Okay, so now that we're getting on to more, what, what do you got there, Alberto? You got stuff. Uh, well, when we, I was distracted by the frost line, and, and that's why I didn't answer immediately. And so Bonnie did the right thing. But I was actually because I was thinking actually how much water is there on Earth compared to the entire mass of the Earth, and so the number is a fraction of a percent. And I remember there was a nice a graph that showed actually if we took the entire water on Earth and uh, made it into a little sphere, how would it compare to the size of the Earth? And that's the, the graph. Oh, okay, you see. so that. So that big ball is the Earth, just the land. That yeah. little ball right next to it is if you took all the water off and made a ball out of it, yeah. how big it would be. Correct. That's like one What's the little drop. dot? Isn't the little dot, I think, is from, I don't know, I think it's actually, I think the big dot is actually salt water and the, and the other dot is actually uh, oh, fresh nice. water. Yeah. Oh, wow, that is a cool graphic. <laughs> so I remember seeing that a while and so I thought, so. Now we need a dot that shows how many people are on the planet <laughs> and, co and compare it with. Yeah, the yeah make us make a ball of seven billion people. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that'll be the next hangout. <laughs> ball of ball seven, seven billion people will be on the hangout. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. World record yeah. again. Yeah, yeah watch that Google Plus. That's right. <laughs> so, but actually, you know, going back to to what we were talking about about in you know, the comment, you know, being active and what Zolt was mentioning and Dr. Lee was saying. So, do we have an idea of actually how Bright. What are the models predicted for the brightness of the of the comet? There was a I think Raya Bagampur that was asking, you know, what are the what are the estimates basically? Do we know? I mean, do, well, we don't know. Obviously, what are the estimates, right? <laughs> well, you've heard estimates. Uh, you've heard estimates suggesting that it could be as bright as the full moon. You know, I'm I'm sure it's very. None of us are in the game of of estimating the brightness, but. Uh, so and it's I'm sure you know it's based on models and it's very speculative. It's a very risky prediction to make. I'm sure. Um, oh come on! Now here's the thing. Yeah, nobody wants to say. Nobody wants nobody to say. Wants to say. <laughs> no, but I guess my, my my question is, you know, I I read as well, and it's like it goes from it's the brightest of the century is, uh, you know, as bright as a full moon to we don't know. And so I understand there's uncertainty, right? But so. Uh, we have more than one comet we looked at. You know, how what is our record? I guess that's the question I'm asking to in being able to predict it. Very bad. Well, I think Very bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, that's good. That's good to know. Yeah. Well, I think I know the answer to what is the brightest comet ever seen on Earth, and it must be the one that killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was the comet of the century. Anyway. Yeah. It just wasn't our century. <laughs> I'm guessing it was incredibly bright on the way yeah, in. Yeah, for a yeah. short period of time. Yes. That's okay. a good one, Max. Well, all right. So, Max, you've done it. This, that's our segue into the topic. Will Comet Ison hit us? Who wants to, who wants to predict? Me. No. Oh, Alberto's oh, going wow. on a limb and saying no. Oh, <laughs> no. Okay, so no, but I, have... I think we mentioned it before, right? Maybe the debris that, you know, left uh, of, the, of the tail, maybe we will go through some of those debris, and those debris will produce nice meteor showers, you know. Who knows? Comets do produce that, so. So I have yeah. this really cool animation that they came out with uh, over at JPL. Can you guys see it? Yep. yep. Okay. So let me make sure I got it big so everybody can see. Let me get the right window. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So here's the here's their uh, prediction of uh, of where Comet Ison will go. I'm just going to go play this. There's music associated with it. So I don't know if you can hear that or not, but nope. Here here no. it comes. Okay, good. So make make some music. Yeah, thing to it. Comet Ison going around right there, and here is where we're now in December eighth, and boom, right about. Whoa, it didn't stop. It kept going. 
<laughs> well, that's what comets do, Tony. I know, but it didn't, my animation kept playing. What are you doing? Go back. Come back to me. Okay. <laughs> so right the pause about, button on the comet. I pushed the it. pause button and it didn't pause. So right about here, what is it? Well, I got to do this without. Oh, this is like really sad. Okay, right oh, about here. Yeah, that's that's December nineteenth. I can't get it right to January. There we go. December twenty fifth. There's Christmas Day. That's one of the closest uh, days that Ison will be. And look, see how far away it is. Many many millions of kilometers away. So this is the closest the comet will get to us. So no, it will not hit us. However, there is a neat little thing that it will do. Uh, that will happen to the Earth right here. Did you see that the Earth on January 17th is right on top of this trajectory where uh, the comet had gone in earlier in the year? That is a path the comet has already taken, and Earth will pass through that. And so maybe, just maybe, there will be a nice little meteor shower somewhere in the middle of January 2014 uh, from the particles left behind uh, when Ison flew through before. So that is the little uh, animation that I had for that. Okay, I want to go back to the question, though. Okay, it will not hit us, but you know, do we know? Do we at least know how? Maybe I asked this already. I don't know. <laughs> do we know you how? Do you pay attention to your own yeah. question? <laughs> no, I do pay attention to my own question. But I guess the question I had was, uh, do we know if it, if it's even going to be visible to the naked eye? I guess this is what lots of people are interested in knowing, right? Yeah, it's a comet of the century. It's like the third one. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just told me that we don't know how good we are good our brother going to be. So how do we, how much do we know about that? Well, well, I think that. Yeah. Go ahead, Max. I think that's. I think you're well suited to comment. Well, on. I mean, there's there's two basic reasons for the hype. One, it's as we talked about earlier, it's a fresh comet coming in from the Oort cloud. So a bunch of uh, you know fresh uh, volatiles that have never seen sunlight up close and personal like this. Right. And also, it's a sun grazing comet. So it's a comet that, as you saw in that video, is getting very close to the sun. Not all comets get that close to the sun, okay? So, you know, again, but we don't, you know, we don't really know exactly, you know, the makeup of this comet or even the size of it, you know, and things like that. So there's some variables in there. But those two components alone, the fact that it's on its first trip in, so it hasn't been worn down from previous uh, trips uh, near the sun, you know, and the fact that it's going to get so close that it's a sun grazer, you know, has expectations high. But, you know, how high? It's hard to say. And again, just to uh, follow up on the point earlier about the uh, being as bright as the full moon, that doesn't mean it was it will appear as big as the full moon. You <laughs> yeah. know, the nucleus. I mean, otherwise, otherwise it would be like the dinosaurs, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> and also, I think uh, you know, in terms of uh, hitting hitting the Earth, you know, as you saw from the video, it's not even that close. I mean, there's other comets and asteroids who, that have come much much closer to the Earth than than what you just saw, and so. Uh, and, and passing through the trail, you know, obviously is not really like a collision. That's just the, the particles left over in the trail, you know, just like every other meteor shower. In fact, there'll be one on August and 11th and 12th is one of the typical uh, annual meteor showers where we're passing through the, uh, you know, the, the trail left by a comet. Uh, and so, again, that's not like colliding with the comet. That's very small particles uh, left over, debris left over from a comet. Right. Okay, while we're on this topic, I want to get to the YouTube comments. J7409 on YouTube goes, if it broke up when it's close to the sun, could a chunk of it hit Earth? Well, breaking up is hard to do. But not for a <laughs> <laughs> well, not for a a well, first of all, let me, let me take a step but back. Not for a how many think yes. it's going to break up? Of the planetary scientists here, how many of you think it's going to break up? That's a good question. I haven't, uh, I haven't been asked to... Uh, to, to to take a position on that. I'm lay. I'm all right. I'm taking. Well, I'm taking bets. I'll be the bookie on it. So. I'll. You know. I'm. I. I I'll. I'll go out on a limb here and say it's going to break up. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it's very hard so, to say. so there you go, folks. Wow. I would. Bonnie, what do you think? I want it to break up. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, I'll say that I want for that to happen. It'll be so exciting. Okay, Jean Yang, your get turn. Some great pictures oh, too. Yeah. I, I kind of uh, you know agree with Bonnie. I think if, if it's gonna if it's gonna do something bad, you know, you know or disappear or break up, then break up is better than disappear. And do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that <laughs> sort, of appeals, sort of appeals to our sense of you know action movies and, and death and destruction, right? <laughs> I have actually a question because okay, so what what are the variables that determine if if it's going to break up or not? I mean, Max mentioned that you know it's a sun grazing, so you know it's a it's the first time. So what are the what are the you know how does the composition the composition, for example, plays into all of this, right? 
Yeah, I mean, there's two things. You know, you, you touched on it, the composition. How, how tightly or loosely assembled is it, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we know that a lot of comets are not tightly assembled. They may be kind of barely hanging together. It's certainly not like a chunk of iron that's really hanging together, right? It's a, a mixture of rock and ice. And then the other thing is when it gets really close to the sun, uh, there's something called the Roche limit where tidal forces, so any two gravitational bodies have tidal forces between them, and, uh, you know, the, the tidal forces between the sun and the moon cause our tides. So it's kind of like how bodies are tugging on each other, right? It, they're kind of torquing on each other. And so as a comet gets really close, a very small comet gets really close to the gigantic sun, the sun is exerting gigantic tidal forces that uh, are exerting different pressure, you know, different forces on each side of the comet and, and uh, possibly ripping it apart. Hold on, hold on, Max. I know, I, I know I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Zolt has to leave. Zolt. I want before you go. I just want to say thank you for the great work you did on the uh, the comet uh, image that we produced on the blog. It's awesome work. Are there anything we is there stuff coming up in the future we can look forward to from from uh, Ison and Hubble? Well, and unfortunately, Hubble can't look at the comet right now. It's uh, we're behind this on the other side of the sun, and nobody else can see it either. But hopefully, when uh, it's visible again to Hubble in the October time. Uh, we'll get some more images. Get some more so, observations. Yeah, okay. get some more observations, and we should have some more images coming. All right. Well, thank you, Zolt. I know you got to go. Thank you for taking the time out to join us. No, this really was a great, uh, great time. Thanks, okay. everybody. All right. Thank Bye. you. Take Bye. care, okay. Zolt. I'm sorry, Max. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you like there. I just wanted to get. I wanted to say goodbye to Zolt before he left. That's okay. I, I was just finishing my point, but I'll just add to what Zolt was saying: is that there are quite a few uh, programs approved. Uh, we have a few that have executed already. John Yang Lee is the involved with uh, you know he's he's leading one of them and uh, the Heritage team has several that are waiting uh, for the comet to reappear in October and November and, and uh, obviously if the comet breaks up or does anything else there be, may be more proposals submitted to get even more uh, orbits uh, with Hubble to observe it. Okay, we we actually got a question early in the yeah. in the uh, in the hangout about this right how, uh, uh, from Tony Burkhardt. Uh, right. How much time has been given to Hubble to image Comet Ison? And so you want to give us. Your answer to that? Yeah, I, ha I do have some notes. I mean, the coin of the realm for Hubble is orbits, um, and, and an orbit is about an hour and a half long. Um, although not the whole orbit may not be usable. It may be something like 50 minutes or so within an orbit. And I'm looking at. Uh, I know there's, uh, you know, several. There's, I guess, four different programs that have executed already, uh, and but not many orbits so far. I mean, each one being, you know, just a, a handful of orbits. I know for us, we've only used uh, two orbits so far. And uh, John Yang can tell you about his program, which executed in April. Um, going forward, there's uh, at least three programs already approved. One is 12 orbits. Uh, another one is 12 orbits. Another one is 19 orbits. Uh, John Yang Lee is involved in at least one of those, if not more. Um, and then the Hubble Heritage Team, we also have uh, uh, four more orbits to do observations similar to what we've already seen, and then we also have one in place to do what's called a target of opportunity in case the comet breaks up. Now, this is why I voted for the comet to break up, uh, <laughs> because we do have a five-orbit. We have a five-orbit program to image the uh, comet if it, on the event that it starts to break up, because that's what Hubble can do could do best. Okay, and and John Yang, you want to tell us a little bit about your program? Um, yes, we 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 had a uh, uh, three uh, three Hubble orbits in April 10th to image the comet, and the, the main purpose was of that observation was actually to to measure the size of the nucleus, because you know we everybody everybody care about whether the the comet is gonna survive the perihelion, mm -hmm. it's gonna break up or what whatever it's gonna do. So so and the size of the nucleus is actually the determining factor. Um, so that's what we do did for with our observations, but unfortunately, well, it looks like the uh, the comet the, the size the size of the nucleus is going to be very small. You know, we, we we right now we have a very conservative upper limit of two kilometers, and it should be small. Two kilometers, you said? Yeah, two kilometers in radius. That's okay. the upper limit. You know, that's not the size. That's the upper limit. So it's not going to be bigger than two two kilometers, two kilometers in radius, and so it it could also be much smaller. We don't know yet. We're still working on our data. So and you're saying that that the, that the the size of the nucleus is related to whether or not it's going to break up? Uh, well, no, no. Actually, I'm sorry. Um, the um, that's one fa one factor. I mean, the um, if it, that 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 if it's too small, it's going to be burnt up in the in uh, burnt up very soon, very very quickly. Right. And that, that means it's going to disappear during her during her passage. 
And whether it's going to break up, that, that's related to where the, to the closest mm -hmm. point, to the distance of the closest point to the, soul, to the sun. And what I can tell you is that, um, you know, the actually comet Einstein is going to pass the point where it's, it's just the, the boundary, of, uh, the boundary of, the, of the region inside of which it's going to break up and outside of which it's not going to break up. And then we know there's an uncertainty for this region. So that's why we say we don't know whether it's going to break up. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So, uh, Scott, you have a question here uh, in the chat. Want you yeah. go ahead? Yeah, this is from, um, from Twitter. This is from at cosmos for you uh, It looks like Daniel Fisher. Yep. And it says, for the NASA diagram, and I can put the link into the event page, it implies that radio observation of ISIN are possible right now. Are those underway? Does anybody know? Actually, um, I don't know. I um, don't know much about it, but I think I think this is from uh, when, I, when I talk to my friends who are working on radio astronomy, and I think it's right right now it's probably still too thin for radio operations. Okay, here's the uh, here's the image. going to pull it up. You have it. Oh, yeah, okay. here's here's the image you're talking about. So what are we looking at here? When will it be observable? And this is oh I see. And then there's a there's different wavelengths uh, yeah. at the at the bottom down here. There is a uh, where it'll be visible in optical, and then a little bit higher up, it'll be in radio. And it started. It looks like back in April or so. Uh, yeah. So it looks like it should be observable now in radio waves. But yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know the answer. If yeah, that, that's like that's uh, is actually uh, from one of my presentation, and uh, this is originally made by my colleague Matthew Knight. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. oh yeah, there's your name. So, You're right. You're right there on that. <laughs> so, so explain, explain this thing. Explain, yes. explain okay. this graph. Well, well, you know what? What this graph graph shows that shows is that um, it's just uh, the geometry, and uh, we know that optical telescopes can point too close to the sun, but radio telescope, telescope, and IR telescopes can. So that's what we what what we show here. Um, you know, the, the shaded area are when the comet is too close to the sun, so we cannot look at it from any with any optical telescopes, including Hubble. And radio can get very close to the sun, so that's why you have you see the continuous uh, green arrows. So in that region, uh, radio can look at it. But but it's also it's still um, limited by the brightness. The brighter it is in radio wavelength, the easier we can see it. Yeah. So I, re I I kind of doubt whether um, uh, radio can see it now because it's still very thin. Okay. And uh, then we have the IR, and then when it's very close to the sun and it's within the field of view of the solar telescopes, that's where solar telescopes are going to look at it. That's within the uh, perihelion in, in, uh, in late November. Do, do you know if someone is going to do any LIDAR observations mm -hmm. of it? Um, LIDAR, I mean, what's LIDAR, uh, Alberto? Mr. Jargon Master. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Mr. Jargon Master. Basically, we shine, we shine, we shine, a, you know, radio waves. It's like a radar, basically. We just shine radio waves. We wait for it to come back, and from the from the delay, we figure out the the shape. For example, we do this with asteroids. We figure out their shape and their. So I don't know if you can do it on a comet. I mean, is it going to be close uh, enough for us to do it? So you have to do it very when you are very close to the comet. Uh, so I don't think. Okay, I, see. I, don't, I don't know. Okay, and then I'm going to figure out what lighter means. Actually, I think it's with with laser. Yeah, but sure. instead of radar, instead of radio, it goes with. Uh, yeah. I forgot the acronym. So it's an acronym within an acronym. I know yeah, because I love, laser is an acronym those. itself. So yeah, I, I know. I love those. I, yeah, the, the, I could be I heard you like there. acronyms. So I put acronyms in your acronyms. So yeah, so exactly. Re acronym. Recursive acronyms. Those are great. Oh, well, guys, we are out of time. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, uh, Dr. Mikey, thank you. Max, thank you for showing up. Uh, Dr. Lee, we really, really appreciated having you here. Um, this has been great. We're going to have another one. Stay tuned for another Hubble Hangout. I don't know if it'll be the next one because we might do something in between, but there will be a Hubble Hangout coming up on getting your own Comet ISON data from the, is it MAST or HLA, Max? Uh, MAST. Okay, from the MAST archive. So the yeah. Mikulski. Archive for Space Telescopes. Thank you. Because <laughs> it changed. <laughs> so <laughs> many acronyms. Yes. So Max will be on hand, I think, to help us get, sort through that and get some Hubble data for ourselves and be able to play with things. So that'll be so look out for that. Also look out for my video on whether or not Comet Ison will hit us. Uh, that'll be coming out in the next twenty four hours or so and I'll be posting and it to the Hubble Site channel YouTube channel. And, and I'll make a Vine version of it. Six seconds and no. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it'll be real quick with Alberto going, no. <laughs> so with Grumpy be... Cat right next to him. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>
so thank you. So I want to thank you guys all for attending. Mm -hmm. Alberto, Scott, this has been, as always, it's been a lot of yeah, fun. Thank absolutely. you for joining us. I really appreciate it. And we'll be back for another one very soon. So, Hubble Huggers, stay tuned, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for watching. And as always, keep looking up.